Hello Booktube, today I'm going to give you the second part in my review of Octopussy and the Living Daylights by Ian Fleming which was published in 1966 and is the 14th and final of the original James Bond books. I read this as a general reread. I'm, re I'm doing the first books which consist of 12 novels and two collections of short stories. Um, and in today's part of the review I'm going to be giving you my review of the second story in the collection, The Property of a Lady. The property of a lady opens up in June at uh, MI6 headquarters where Bond is uh, quite bored because there hasn't been any work for him to do and he's got very little paperwork to do. Uh, then he gets called up to Adam's office and uh, he meets with M and Dr Fanshawe who is a arts and jewellery expert. Dr Fanshawe in tow of Bond that uh, a Fabergé egg which was previously only thought to exist in Carl Fabergé's drawings has been put up for auction, is going to be put up for auction sort of these in the next few days by one Miss Maria Freudenstein. Now this is in, of interest to the service because the service know Miss Freudenstein is a Soviet agent who is working for them. Uh, she, they knew she was a Soviet agent when she um, applied to join the service and they recruited her to use her as a double, as an, un as an unknown double agent. Um, they put her on uh, in the communication room of put her in charge of something called a uh, purple cipher which officially uh, sends intelligence from MI6 to the CIA in Washington but it in fact only exists to feed the Soviets um, uh, false information. Uh, M uh, thinks that the Fabergé is, uh, is a payment for her services because uh, Miss uh, Freudenstein has been working in the service for three years and she, and as far as he can tell and the service can tell the information the Soviets are receiving they seem to absolutely believe them. Um, now at this point uh, this at this point M just says it's of interest to them and thanks Dr Fanshawe and then he leaves at which point Bond proposes something to M. Uh, due to the, due to the uh, nature of the egg it's going to uh, go for quite a bit but Bond suspects that the Soviets are going to try and increase the price by sending somebody to the auction to bid, up, bid it up and Bond also points out that because of the secret nature of Miss Freudenstein's uh, status as a mole inside MI6, outside of Moscow, the only person who will know who uh, she is is the KGB resident in the uh, London Embassy. And so Bond proposes that the person who will be doing the bidding at Sotheby's will be the resident. And Bond suggests that he should go along to the um, just the bit, along with the team from MI5 to. Um, <coughs> to identify the, the resident. M uh, supports this because he does not know who the resident is and if they can identify him he can go to the foreign office and they can get the resident ex um, thrown out of the country as a spy which will screw up the KGB's um, uh, set up in London for a couple of months because it would take them that long to get a new resident put in place. Uh, so And also and also M is thinking of increasing Freudenstein's, um, the, increasing the sort of intelligence that he's going to put through um, the purple cipher and it will make things easier if the KGB resident isn't in the country at that point and it will, will mean that um, any questions that might be raised at that point won't be raised because he won't be able to raise them. And so um, Bond gets to say so and MI5 uh, and he sort of things out along with, a, along with uh, one of the bidders uh, called Mr. Snowman, who is brought into the scheme um, to act as Bond's guest, uh, to act as a uh, to who take Bond lot sorry to take Bond along to the uh, auction at Sotheby's as a guest. Uh, Bond goes along to the the, the auction. Uh, during the auction, Bond then identifies the man and uh, he follows. And after the auction, Bond uh, follows the uh, KG man back to the Russian embassy in a taxi and confirms that it is him because he turned because he's taxi. He actually pulls up outside the Soviet Embassy, and that's where the story ends. Now, overall, uh, enjoyable story, uh, not as action-packed as usual. Though, I should say the uh, the auction scenes are very enjoyable to read. Um, like with the card scenes of the the card games in the other in the Bond novels, but Ed Fleming is really able to get uh, build a sense of tension in the the auction. Also, there's a nice reference in here to. Um, the assassination attempt that Bond makes on him at the beginning of *The Man with the Golden Gun*, because it describes the um, the the the, um, the the pistol that shoots liquid cyanide, and it's described in Bond when Bond gets called up to M's office. Bond's reading a report from the uh, that's uh, been uh, caught from the Soviets, 
uh, describing this weapon. Uh, so that's a nice uh, callback as well. Um, uh, I think this story must be set late, uh, very early 60s, before, um, I think it must be before, on a Majesty Secret Service, I should imagine, because there's no uh, reference to Spectre, or maybe even before Front, uh, no, it couldn't be before Front War, because it reference that um, Freudenstein gets recruited in 59. So I'm not quite sure on the, the on the, um, the time, but it's, uh, it's clearly set before uh, Bond, before on a Majesty Secret Service. Um, <coughs> but as I say, overall, really enjoyable, a nice little story, very compact, um, not any particular, no no fighting or no gun uh, gunplay, but nevertheless enjoyable. And those scenes, as I say, in the auction house are uh, very um, uh, full of tension, uh, just as I say with the card games. So um, with that, I will say goodbye, BookTube, and I will see you um, uh, tomorrow with the next part in the review, which will be of the short story, The Living Daylights.